Hi there, I'm George Marshall from anyoldmusic.com where we create resources and courses, things like that, uh, for music makers. Today we're going to be analysing and investigating the composition of George Bizet's Fallon Dollar uh, from the second Lali Zen orchestral suite. In this video we're going to pay particular attention to the orchestration, uh, texture and melodic material. Identifying straightforward procedures in these areas, I want to demonstrate how, you know, as composers and or arrangers, uh, we don't need to do backbreaking stuff to create effective music. Before moving on to context, it's probably worth bearing in mind that I am painfully monolingual uh, and will undoubtedly un mispronounce many of the names I'm about to say. So yeah, sorry for that. Lolly Zen, or The Woman from Isles as it's often translated into English, was originally a play produced in 1872. It was actually ad adapted from an 1868 novel by the author Alphonse Daudet. <laughs> Bizet was commissioned to write the incidental music for the play and actually performed the harmonium part in the premiere performance. Despite the poor reception of the play, which only received 21 runs, which if it had one performance a day was three weeks, uh, Beezy went on to arrange the first concert suite that same year, and since then the music has become uh, and has remained popular in orchestral concert programmes. Uh, the second concert suite uh, was arranged seven years later in 1879, four years after Bizet's death. Unsurprisingly, this arrangement wasn't uh, done by Bizet, because he died four years earlier. But it was actually... Uh, done by his friend and fellow contemporary uh, composer, Ernest Giroux. The original play, according to Wikipedia, reliable source, I know, had a much more modest contingent of players than the later arrangements that are for full orchestra. I presume this is a budgetary decision, no different to live performance or recording today. Uh, Bizet will have likely needed to strike a balance between what he needed for his music and what budgets uh, would allow for you know, when, while running the whole production, the whole play. On the on-screen table, it's easy to see the difference between the orchestra for the incidental music and the orchestra for the second suite. The original orchestra had a specified number of strings, uh, only two brass players in the form of French horns, and then a group of six woodwind players. In arranging the second orchestral suite, the brass section is increased in size dramatically, uh, the harmonium is dropped, uh, woodwinds are doubled throughout. There is the notable addition of a saxophone, although that doesn't actually play in Farandola. And extra, interestingly, the piano becomes interchangeable with the harp. The interchangeability of the harp and piano is explained in a concert note at the bottom of the first orchestral suite, which states that the piano is suggested for orchestras with smaller string sections. Presumably, as we can see in the harp part for the first movement of the first suite, this is so the piano can cue and support important lines in the string orchestra, stronger dynamically uh, than the harp. If a smaller string section needed uh, some support in a performance, the piano, through playing those cues, can provide it. The same performance note from the first suite explains the use of music cues, particularly for the saxophone, an instrument that was in its infancy uh, during this period. It was an orchestral guest and sadly remains one still today for the most part. Therefore having a score and parts that can cover the absence of certain instruments such as the saxophone or possibly sort of lower chairs of the brass instruments it makes it a more accessible uh, piece for programming for different orchestras. The second suite has a similar shorter performance note, which together, along with the addition of cued parts, shines a pragmatic light in, onto attitudes towards arranging, orchestration and performance of this time, offering flexibility in instrumentation for cues and suggestions for suitable alternatives will mean more orchestras can program the music, a lesson I suppose we can still certainly heed today as composers, orchestrators and arrangers. The orchestration and arrangement of Farandola is gracefully simple. Giru communicates the sectional structure of the work by making switches of texture, along with simple additive and subtractive orchestration, increasing or taking plays away at the beginning and end of sections. This additive process is best demonstrated by the passage from section 3, bar 17, 
through to the beginning of section 8, bar 85. Through this part of the movement the orchestra builds gradually, going from a single flute and clarinet combination, accompanied by strings, to a, an orchestral tutti that sees the brass accompany a woodwind and string melody in octaves. Considering texture, we can begin to see how Giru can get even more interest out of the material. Melody and accompaniment with the addition of counter melody in the final sections is the primary texture of the work. For variation though, he also uses other textures such as homophony, where voices move together to produce a chordal hymnal texture. Uh, this is used uh, the, in the opening and the middle section of the work. Polyphony follows this in the form of a two-part canon during the introduction of Farandol, just after the, the initial homophonic uh, setting of the first theme. Polyphony distinguishes itself from homophony by elevating melody. For example, if you were to extract each line from a polyphonic texture, it should have melodic interest on its own as a monophonic texture. In the case of the canon, the same melody is played against itself but offset. The harmony in a canon, therefore, emerges from the, the linear unfolding of these two melodies against one another. Monophony, uh, which appears in the middle section of Farandola, is a line played on its own in unison or in octaves. The melodic material on Farandola is scarce and the motivic developments are modest too with only a couple of periods within the piece where the melody is subjected to any motivic change. The main developments occur in large-scale changes to the themes via transposition into different tonalities and modes. If we take the earlier chart and now add in tonal scheme of the work, we can see the tonal areas explored are compact, with clear relationships between each of the tonal changes. Each modulation can be defined as parallel or relative, for instance, D major is a prevailing key of the work, but the work opens in the parallel D minor. In the middle section, we move to the relative minor, B minor, before returning to D major uh, to close the piece. These closely knit tonalities give the works a structural balance between variety and expansiveness. Melodically, the work presents four 16-bar melodies, each made up by two similar 8-bar sentences. Despite being juxtaposed in the final two-thirds of the work in a way that makes them seem unrelated, the opposite is quite true. Each one of the four melodies is related to two others, one linearly and one contrapuntally. To outline these relationships, I label the themes A1, A2, B1 and B2 in the structural overview which we've already had a look at. The letters signify linear relationship and the number corresponds to contrapuntal relationships. So A1 precedes A2, B1 sits above B2. The A1 theme is the theme many of us attribute to Lali Zen, as it also appears in the opening prelude that Bizet arranged in the first suite. Giru may reprise the melody here because of its use in the first movement. Western classical music has a fondness for reprising or recapitulating melodies. Furthermore, it is not uncommon for orchestras to program the two suites together. Perhaps that was an ambition of Giru by bringing the second uh, concert suite into existence. Uh, impossible to predict, it's not implausible to think recapitulation and dual programming of the first and second suite could have been a consideration in Giru's process of arranging the second suite. Both the A1 and A2 melodies are from a carol called La Marche de Ré. In this carol, the A2 theme is the second sentence in a larger theme, which Bizet also exposes uh, in full in the prelude of the first suite. However, in Farandola, Giru exposes the A2 mel melody uh, midway through the movement, breaking the carol into two parts. The knowledge that this is a traditional French melody, likely well known by French music goers of the time, changes the whole complexion of the movement. Giru denies expectations, creating a form of, I guess, melodic dissonance that is not resolved until the final section of the movement when we hear the themes linearly fold together. The B1 and B2 themes are what characterises this work as a farandola. Light, they capture the dance-like quality of a farandole, which is a traditional dance in Provencal France. Poetry. Having not been able to access performance, I would be interested to know how the themes operate in the play narratively and musically. 
the use of the pre-existing melody and the farandola, I imagine I used to reinforce the setting. Arles, being a city in Provencal France, has a strong cultural identity as part of this wider region which the farandola belongs. The linear relationship of the B themes is much clearer than that of the A themes. Following the truncated A1 exposition in D minor, both melodies are repeated many times. However, it's this order and multitude of repetitions that the linear relationship is also veiled in a way, making each melody seem like its own whole. It's only really in the final section that the relationship of all the themes becomes apparent through the counterpointing of the two themes, and then their linear unfolding as well in the final section. In the final part of Farandola, the second relationship between the melodies emerges. This is shown by the numbers. While the letter corresponds to linear unfolding, the number corresponds to the counter-melody relationships, the contrapuntal relationships. The A1 theme count points B1 and A2 count points B2. The effect of this is quite strident made even more poignant by the return of D major, which we had earlier in the piece, and the transposition of those A themes from relative and parallel minor. Furthermore, the hearing of all of the material in full form together adds to the effect. This is probably the first time in the short piece that we have heard all the themes unfold together. A short movement, particularly by 19th century standards, they were a bit loquacious in the 19th century. There is a lot for us to learn as music makers from Farandola. Economical, it just demonstrates that you do not need a great deal of complexity to create something for an orchestra that is compelling. Instead, you can use the orchestra itself as a device for variation through colour, texture and dynamic versatility. Furthermore, if you have one melody, why not use it as the foundation for a second one, creating a counter melody to that melody? You know, and then you can expose them separately throughout the piece. You could then just transpose those melodies into closely related keys for variation. You know, control the complexity of your work to meet the time uh, that you have and the inspiration and motivation you have as well. If you've enjoyed this video, then subscribe, like and give us some feedback or questions, comments, things like that below. If you think you'd like a PDF of my musical analyses, I send these out uh, singularly as attachments in my uh, regular newsletters whenever I've made one. Also, be sure to check out any old music for more content. I actually have an article version of this video, which you know I can update a lot easier uh, than the video. Um, there's also other things over there, other articles and things like that, with video content to come. So, yeah, thank you very much for watching. Hope you'll tune in next time.